they are the same people who demanded 5% Muslim reservation and the Prophet Muhammad uh, and other religious heads prohibition of uh, Slander Act 2021. Now it's called the Prophet Muhammad and other religious heads prohibition of Slander Act. Now, other religions really don't have any sort of uh, mandate to go after people who slander them, you know, it, it's not sanctioned by religion, yes. you know, only Islam is. Very good evening, viewers. My name is Sharon Sethi and you're watching The Current Affairs Show on Chitta Media. Tripura is again on the news. Last week, we had a discussion on the alleged violence that was conducted by fringe elements in Tripura. Right after a week, the BJP has stunned everybody with a spectacular victory in the local elections in the state. To discuss the factors behind these elections and the real reasons why there was an alleged violence in Tripura is Rami Desai with us today. Ramiji, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Sharon. Namaskar. And thank you for having me again on your show. Namaste. It's always a pleasure to have you on your show. What is your analysis of uh, the BJ's, uh, BJP's uh, victory in uh, the Tripura elections? Uh, what are the contributing factors? Um, Sharon, uh, th this is a very short analysis uh, that one can have on the elections, because I think the real meat of the matter will be in the assembly elections in 2023. Right. But having said that, uh, the results of these elections have not really been surprising. Um, it seems looking at the result that BJP is as strong as it was during the last assembly elections, and it will continue to do so. Um, Obviously, we saw the entry of TMC as a disrupting force uh, and whatever little chances that the left had has been demolished by this disrupting force that has come in. It hasn't really affected the BJP, but of course, it's affected the left that, uh, you know, that held on to power for so long in Tripura till BJP came and uh, uh, dislodge them from their position of power. Now, if you look at it, uh, this time TMC, uh, I know TMC is rather excited and Abhishek Banerjee has been uh, saying that uh, they have become the primary opposition. But, you know, if you look at the vote share, 20% has gone to the TMC, 18.5% has gone to uh, the left, the communists, and 56% has gone to the BJP. So if we were to compare, uh, TMC's difference with the left is only one and a half percent. That doesn't really make you into uh, a big contender when your primary opposition is at 56 percent. So mm -hmm. I think TMC might be projecting more of a power play than they have actually made. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think TMC with these numbers can truly establish themselves as a major opposition. Uh, but like I said before, clarity will only come after the 2023 assembly elections. Um, of course, it, 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 the, you know, we've seen tactics and we've seen uh, TMCs make a lot of comments uh, to sort of make up for uh, the loss in the vote share that, you know, they obviously did not expect. Otherwise, they would not be saying things like that the votes have been, uh, the elections have been rigged by the BH, uh, BJP. And I think this is really childish. And this entire argument, whenever it happens in a place where the opposition loses, I think has become pretty uh, evident that it is a very childish argument because when you win, it's the same electronic voting machines that you used in West Bengal. That time you didn't have a problem with it. But today that you haven't met your own expectations, your party leadership expectations, you feel that uh, calling out uh, uh, and uh, casting doubt on our election process is a um, good idea to cover your tracks. But I think uh, this is a very childish excuse coming from anywhere. So I don't think that holds water. But having said that, I think one of the biggest takeaways from the Tripura elections is that uh, BJP has retained its indigenous vote share as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it is also important to note that um you know looking at the recent violence uh, 
um, that happened in Maharashtra based on what they thought had happened in Tripura. Uh, at the end of the day, people have continued to vote for good governance, you know, development and um, uh, good governance trumps over communal, uh, projected communal discord. So I think these are possibly one of our two big uh, giveaways, uh, takeaways from these elections. Right. But how did the BJP manage to rise in the Northeast and especially in Tripura? Because Northeast, East and South of India were considered to be uh, the bastion of other regional parties. But suddenly you see the BJP replacing the, uh, the Congress in the Northeast and in Tripura now they're the dominating power. Um, at the end of the day, Sharon, like I said before, that uh, development and good governance uh, seems to trump any sort of communal differences, any sort of communal discord. Uh, at the end of the day, um, these are states, uh, the Northeastern states, the uh, previous dispensations policies towards these states was to keep it at status quo. Right. Um, we felt that uh, uh, they felt that if there was a lack of development, if there was a, at least this was the excuse that they gave, that if there was a lack of development, if there was lack of infrastructure, if there was a lack of uh, political will in these areas, uh, there would be less international enemy vested interest. Um, clearly, that is not the stance that the BJP has taken with their, uh, with their policy, with the very, very active policy of Act East. Um, infrastructure and development is uh, primary to them. And I think that is what people of Tripura had hoped for. That is what had been denied to them for so many decades. And I think um, uh, in, uh, since the party has been pa in power, they've clearly uh, gained uh, in popularity. And therefore, I think that has been the game changer. So at the end of the day, I think development and good governance is something that resonates with people who have been denied the same for a really long time, resulting in unequal development between that region and the rest of the regions of the country. Right. And also Tripura happens to share a very strategic border with Bangladesh. And this border, you know, has sprouted several uh, unrest uh, in the incidents of unrest in Tripura. Uh, so the issue of illegal immigration has also become a major political issue with uh, the CANRC debate uh, reigniting time and again whenever there's an election around the corner. Uh, so as far as that issue is concerned, how do you uh, place that in order with the recent violence uh, that has occurred, uh, that has allegedly occurred in uh, Tripura? Um, Sharon, um, I don't think there's really a direct connection, honestly. I feel that the alleged violence in, uh, this is my opinion, of course, in Tripura was actually just a construct before the elections. This was uh, uh, some amount of uh, dirty politics that was being played. There was an attempt to create divisions and uh, uh, divisions amongst uh, people of a generally peaceful society. Uh, Tripura has been known to have insurgent issues, but that has been uh, that has been mitigated to quite uh, an extent. You know, I remember traveling to Tripura over a decade ago, and uh, there used to be many insurgent outfits like NLFT, and uh, you know, there used to be uh, a lot of turbulent violence struggles by different outlawed uh, outfits. Uh, uh, TNB was one, United Bengali Liberation Front was one. Um, National uh, Liberation Front of Tripura, NLFT was one, All Tripura Tiger Force was one. You know, all of this has, uh, uh, you know, all of this has been brought uh, to some conclusion, more or less. Uh, so Tripura is really not uh, in the position that it used to be 10 years ago. It's in a far better position. It And these insurgent groups, mind you, were not just because of, uh, of uh, illegal immigration, but there were a lot of vested interests. For instance, uh, ISI was uh, functioning at a high level in, from Bangladesh. A lot of uh, insurgent groups were being supported by, um, uh, uh, they were being supported by these uh, uh, organizations from these geographical locations. And because the borders were porous, it was very difficult to sort of, uh, uh, manage the situation at that time. But uh, uh, the CANRC, I don't think, 
had much to do with uh, you know this alleged violence or had anything to do with this entire construct that had been made uh, if you noticed uh, uh, i've actually written an article about it that uh, from the 23rd and 24th of october uh, we started seeing a huge amount of uh, material propaganda material crop up on the internet and this was all about how uh, tripura uh, was under attack the minority community in tripura was being targeted how mosques had been demolished surprisingly and i'm sure you won't be surprised because you probably have heard of this that um, um, all these websites were from maharashtra they right. were not from tripura you know and a lot of these uh, this propaganda material a lot of uh, uh, the, the rallies that were organized were organized in maharashtra right. you know the violence happened in maharashtra Raza Academy was uh, very much uh, uh, involved in organizing these rallies, and we know the antecedents of Raza Academy. We know how uh, uh, how motivated they are, and from what direction they have been motivated, and where they are leading to. They these kind of pressure tactics are not tactics that have not been used before. They've been used time and again by the Raza Academy. They have been able to mobilize people. They've been able to mobilize rallies and sitting in the Mumbai office, they have been able to multiple times um, give out fatwas, okay. you know? So we have to look at whatever, and considering that the head of, uh, uh, the, head of uh, the majority of the mosques in uh, uh, Tripura, um, were, uh, 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 you know, which is uh, the head of jamaat e ulema Hind. Uh, I think uh, the gentleman's name is Maulana Mukti Rahman. He himself said that uh, there has been no mosque that has been destroyed. Our home minister made that uh, comment uh, and said that, uh, you know, things are under control. There is no violence, no mosques have been destroyed. The DG of Tripura police also said the same thing. How is it that these groups and these vested interests on the other side of the country um, took out a rally, uh, did a band, uh, enforced a curfew on people who didn't want to follow the curfew, which eventually turned into violence? Did they miss out all this information? So at the end of the day, we have to look at, uh, I feel, all this uh, violence that happens, which is based on a communal agenda, we have to see it in a larger context. And I think that's what happened with the Zibura case. So it's quite evident that the Raza Academy and the uh, radical Pareli Islamist uh, groups has a certain vested interest even uh, with the Northeast and in uh, Tripura to be specific. But can you qualify this for me? Uh, why exactly are they uh, vested in this? Um, you know at the end of the day it's not uh, uh it's not a very difficult uh, uh analysis to come upon you know uh, uh these groups there is this sort of general brotherhood um yeah. and uh, there is this sort of pressure tactics uh, that are being played on our present dispensation yeah. um these groups are very very well versed with pressure tactics um raza academy is the same academy that in 1986 uh, when Mufti uh, Akhtar Raza Khan was arrested by the Saudi government, held protests in, in India. Yes. You know, uh, congregations were held, processions were taken out, and the Saudi government was forced to release Khan after 11 days. In 1988, the first fatwa against Salman Rushdie was issued by Raza Academy. In yes. 2000, Raza Academy opposed the Slima Nasreen's visit to Mumbai. You know, in, uh, let's not forget, and I think this is possibly one of the worst blots on you know an organization that calls itself an academy which i would assume sharon an academy means a place of discipline a place of learning but in 2012 raza academy held protest in mumbai's uh, azad maidan against atrocities on muslims in myanmar and riots in assam um, the protests turned violent Three OB vans were uh, uh, burned, 11 vehicles were set on fire. They said that women constables were injured. You know, in 2015, they issued another fatwa. This time it was against uh, the Oscar award winning musician A.R. Rahman and uh, uh, that Iranian um, filmmaker Majid Majidi for right. their involvement in the film uh, Muhammad, Messenger of God. Now they have been after. Uh, they have been after uh, Mr. Basim uh, Rizvi, 
you know, and they've been trying to pressure the government uh, uh, to take action against him. Uh, you see, um, uh, in the case of Raza Academy, the movement that they followed is based on the application of blasphemy laws. So right. anything that is against that is of offense to them. Also, like I said, if they have supported other, uh, uh, you know, if they've supported, uh, you know, other organizations that they feel are a part of their faith, um, obviously they will have vested interests uh, within, uh, uh, you know, India as well, and especially when it comes to creating pressure tactics or being a strategic arm of somebody else to create these pressure tactics. You know, they, uh, they are the same people who demanded 5% Muslim reservation and the Prophet Muhammad uh, and other religious heads prohibition of uh, Slander Act 2021. Now it's called the Prophet Muhammad and other religious heads prohibition of Slander Act. Now other religions really don't have any sort of uh, mandate to go after people who slander them you know it, it's not sanctioned by religion yes. you know only islam is so this entire bill even if they say other religious heads prohibition of slander act it actually is only serving the purpose for blasphemy laws right. you know so you you know i think um, it's fairly uh, clear that a lot of these organizations uh, act as pressure groups and uh, the interconnectivity because of social media and the amount of propaganda material that can be circulated is absolutely mind-boggling and nobody cross-checks let me tell you on the 23rd and 24th of october like i said you know when there was a sudden flood of visuals on social media there were messages and you know there was uh, it was shocking because the kind of YouTube channels and the kind of headlines that they had. First of all, you know, there were old BBC videos of Delhi riots, visuals of an explosion in Pakistan, a Karachi fuel station blast, among so many others that were being portrayed as violence in Tripura. And there are some really popular content makers who crop up and, you know, I think investigation to what uh, of what their funding is, what their support basis is really, really important because right. uh, content creators like Mufti Harun uh, Nadwi of Viral News has 1.3 million subscribers. Uh, this is a huge amount of viewership uh, which can go astray and in a, uh, in a religiously uh, sensitive country like ours right. um, can have a very negative repercussion. So they had headlines uh, appealing for help for Tripura Muslims who were being attacked by Hindu Atankwadis. This was their headline. Another uh, channel, which was called Tahaf, uh, Tahafuz uh, Edeen, um, it has about, I think, 700, 705,000 uh, subscribers, had things like uh, headlines saying, Musulmano tayar ho jao, um, Tripura mein police ka zalimana role. I mean, this is uh, this is absolutely uh, absolutely uh, inciting. This is in, insightful material. Another one said, "Muslimano pe zulm karne walo ka anjam." Now, if this is an insightful, what is? You know, this is hate mongering, and this is your circulating videos, um, which you have not verified. Of course, I know that our intelligence agencies have done their job and. There have been arrests that have been made, but uh, this is just in response to your question as to how this is all interconnected. I don't think there is a, a direct, uh, you know, this comes out of a good place in their hearts. You know, there, there, there isn't a direct connection, but wherever they can build pressure, they will. Right. Thank you so much for that elaborate uh, and detailed answer. Uh, there's another issue, uh, perhaps not as uh, electorally significant, but is in the news nevertheless. Uh, there is a movement for the creation of a greater Tripura land. Uh, you know, uh, a political party has also been formed and they've been forming alliances. But, but fortunately or not, uh, they managed to win only one seat uh, in this election. Uh, so do you actually think there is a uh, body and substance to this demand? Um, you know, I honestly, if you ask me, I'll give you a really, really honest answer. I think it's ridiculous. Uh, 
you know the new demand seeks to include every tribal person living in an indigenous area or village outside Tripura tribal areas autonomous district council the ITAA DC uh, under this proposed model of greater Tripura land um, but the idea doesn't restrict to simply the Tripura tribal council areas uh, it also seeks to include uh, uh, Tiprasa of Tripuri spread across uh, different states of India like Assam, Mizoram, as well as uh, those living in uh, Bandarpan, Chittagong, you know, uh, places like that. So uh, when you ask me if uh, this demand for greater Tripura land is, uh, uh, you know, if it has metal, I don't think so, because how are you going to do it? Are you going to uh, uh, redraw territorial um, uh, boundaries? And uh, how do you propose to redraw them? Who is going to cede any land to you? We've already seen what has happened between Assam and Mizoram. We know that you know our indigenous uh, brothers and sisters, if there's one thing that they are very, very possessive about, is the land that they are on is the land that belongs to them so i think um, this could only lead to a lot of disturbances in the area i uh, you know i know that they feel that greater pepra land would help Tripuri is in need of assistance in those areas but uh, it has to be a practical idea you cannot uh, you know you cannot change the boundaries of an entire region um, because there are tributaries that are scattered in a lot of the states. It's not a question of one other state, you know. Um, so I think, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, the reasons that have been given are uh, greater temporary and have, the demand for it has uh, risen because of unfulfilled demands of uh, revising the NRC. Um, but I don't think that's true. I think this is um, a political play. I think this is a political play to pull on some emotional strings uh, to garner support from Tripuris living in other areas to create some sort of a, a pressure tactic. Um, and it also to me, because I've studied uh, 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 NSCN and uh, their demand for greater Nagalem for a really long time, it also re you know, reeks of the same sort of uh, intention Great, you know, it it reeks of uh, wanting to create a larger front for yourself, you know, for other vested interests. Um, and I don't think uh, Greater Nagalem did any, uh, you know, had any benefits to uh, Bharat. And I don't think Greater Tripra land is going to. At the end of the day, you know, uh, it's a we are a democratic country. We don't need to make such uh how do i put it such uh moves that are really not thought through you know now that the elections are over we'll have to see how well it sustains uh ramiji thank you so much it's always a pleasure talking to you thank you sharon uh, and thank you for inviting me again please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel for our other social media links more content and to support our work Please visit citti.net. Dhanavad, Namaskar.